Okay, thank you. So, uh, very belated welcome from my side as well, and thanks to all of those who have spoken. We uh, have already heard about a couple of points for debate, as Reinhilde pointed out. Uh, is this really a middle technology trap, or have we been abandoned by Schumpeter or Schumpeterian spirit, or both? Uh, is it uh, is DARPA really a model for us, or um, do we need something different because Europe is different from the U.S. or we are talking about different uh, objectives? And uh, Mr. Schulte has also reminded us that yes, there are some uh, successes also. I mean, this the, the, this report, yes, it is a little gloomy, uh, but not everything's bad. So we've heard about some successes, and I think it's also very important that there is intensive evaluation going on. Uh, existing program. So the idea of this event is for it to be interactive. Uh, so we would like you, to, all of you, uh, we would like to invite all of you to make uh, comments uh, or ask questions. And my suggestion would be um, that we collect a few points and then um, uh, everybody has the opportunity to react also to the points raised uh, in the um, in the remarks. We've uh, so. Let me ask, are there, are there remarks? Please, uh, would you introduce, kind of introduce yourself yes, briefly? Paul Nemitz, I'm a lawyer from the European Commission. For many years I've been member of the Industrial Policy Committee at the SPD board in Berlin. And I have learned there that the innovation model uh, of the digital economy, you know, minimal viable option, a 19 year old can come and create a company which scales all over the world is completely different from the innovation model in the classic industries, which I think you call mid-tech, because there, 90% of the innovation is done by engineers, which are more than 20 years in the company, and the innovation consists of tightening the screw a quarter of a millimeter more. So, you know, that's, for example, a reason why, at, at, at the Germans, at, at least that was my um, impression, were not very impressed by these statistics that uh, you know China churns out six million uh, engineers every year, because this type of innovation, which takes place in the classic industrial machine building, also in the car industry, is not something which is can be uh, done in programs and takes place you know the, by these engineers which come from the university. It is things which presuppose being in the company for a very long time. And it is something which is not taught at the university. So I just would like to understand, uh, you know, I, I looked at your report quickly, but there's a complete absence of the analysis of the different innovation models in the different types of industries. So that's my question, whether that plays a role or whether you wise women and men think that's old stuff, not relevant anymore. Thank you very much. So, um, may you know, Reinhild, would you like to react to that? Yeah, I think it's a bit, the, the argument is a bit also trapped <laughs> in, in, in incumbent business models uh, here. So even if you think of, of like car manufacturing or electronics, the implications of new technologies for these business models are very important and they change how you, how you produce, how you, how you supply your products to the markets. So it's a completely, it's really, kind of drastic innovations for your business models here that we have to think of in every sector here. So this, these digital technologies and particularly AI or general purpose technologies that will change the way in which we produce and in which we sell to, to, to markets here. And that's what we have to take into account. Are our business models and our innovation models, are they sufficiently contestable? <laughs> uh, so are we open for these new technologies to improve? Are they robust to these new technologies to keep a leading position in these markets? If we don't do this, others like the US or China will be doing this here and we'll be losing our position even if we're very good in, in just repeating what we've been done before here. So in that respect, I think we have to be really very contestable and, and using the Schumpeterian creative destruction, which means also destructing what we have been doing before and analyzing whether that's sufficiently sufficiently robust to to be able to be the next leading uh, here. These technologies are really constantly changing uh, in, in how we have to think of our business models uh, here and they have to be robust for that. Thank you, Daniel. Would you like to 
I think you gave, uh, the question gave us a very good illustration of what we call this technology trap, right? In a sense that you self-perpetuate specialization in certain sectors, and I think uh, Jean showed you that the same sectors, almost the same companies, have been leading in terms of uh, uh, measured at least R&D efforts for more than 20 years. Whereas in Europe, that is, whereas in the U.S., it has it has changed uh, completely, and uh, I think that is the the fundamental problem to link it with what you said. Um, what we need is that somebody perhaps thinks about different processes, which are outside the zone of comfort of uh, of the existing firms, and therefore then can start a new whatever industry or a new a new way. Um, uh, one one example which I gave earlier was uh, about uh, uh, the one success story in Europe about high tech, uh, namely the Dutch uh, uh, maker of chip making machines, ISML, which you many of you have heard about. Um, that uh, was a spin-off of a Dutch company, I believe it was Philips, because it wasn't right wasn't turning the screw a bit more, it was something completely different. Another interesting aspect of that company is that uh, um, it was actually based on a process which was developed for DARPA, uh, which however a US company thought was too far away from being commercially uh, um, um, viable and therefore they abandoned it, whereas in this case the European company uh, um, persisted, and I think that's the kind of thing we are, we are looking for. Uh, very often, you need the initial technology support. Uh, the initial support uh, technology needs support from government, from the EU, and then if the markets, as you say, are contestable, then it can actually go through. Maybe maybe a third aspect, without wanting to stay too long on this. Third aspect is that. What you're suggesting is that uh, measuring innovation is not so easy. So we have been talking a lot about inputs. How, mu how much money do you spend? But uh, of course, the question ultimately is, you know, what's the output? But in terms of output, I mean, something we discuss in the report. But in terms of output, we do observe that traditional industries, EU industries, where these people are working and operate, they, yes, have been successful in the past, but they are not growing very fast. So the fast-growing sectors are other areas, if you look at patents and so on, other indicators, productivity, uh, profit margins, it's all weak. That's why turning the screw a little is fine, but maybe not. Please. Professor Fisdia, just to uh, pick up on the debate, I like very much what you said on contestability and that being an important factor. And President Monti at the, uh, at the beginning made a very uh, high level a political statement, we're comparing the US and Europe and it would be good if the EU was more like the US, i.e. let's say a federal state. Uh, now I wonder, and th this is really one of the, the questions I have when, after reading the report, having DARPA in the US and having DARPA in Europe, uh, um, if, we, if we were to, uh, that, that's one of the suggestions in the report, what would it give? Uh, if otherwise the current circumstances in the EU are as they are and compared to the US and I'm, I'm presuming uh, that that you're making the point the US has the contestability and Europe has too little of it so that that would be for me the, the main question you supplant DARPA to Europe you put it into the environment that there is currently there and what what do you think it would give we say if we were supposed to do that in a in proposing a program, we would have to do an impact assessment. So maybe you can give us a uh, give us a glimpse at how that would look like. Yeah, I think this is a really very important part point that you're making here. So DARPA is really all about how to. We will have to make much more choices in future because we we need really to to have much more mission oriented type of innovation that directs us to decarbonization, strategic autonomy, defense that we all need here, and that's exactly what the DARPA of ARPA model is about: mission oriented. Uh, research in nascent technologies uh, where the market would not be initially taking up uh, here. But 
next to that, we also need to be sure that whatever we support initially will also be eventually be taken up by the market uh, here. And that's where, of course, the strength also is of the US. It has, because it has a much stronger bottom-up innovation uh, ecosystem here, it can make choices and then leave these initial choices to the market to pick up here. This is why for us, anyway, having a kind of much more mission-oriented innovation policy approach will always be difficult because we are still lagging a bit behind in terms of having that strong bottom-up innovation. And this is why I always also advocate for having a good balance between on the one hand being mission-oriented with very specific instruments, but at the same time also making sure that we support enough and, and also develop enough that bottom-up innovation system that we would actually need here with subsidies, but also with much more horizontal framework conditions like single market, capital markets union here. So we really need to work on way more than the US on a mix of policy instruments if we want to, to have that mission-oriented approach that we will need in future, also to be way more effective. Uh, yeah. So you have a big <laughs> challenge. Can, 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 I, can I maybe, Jean, ask you um, what your view is on the relationship between this idea of mission orientation versus bottom-up? So. Uh, you know, how do you see this this balance? I think we all agree we need some of both, but looking at Europe and its particular structures, uh, what is the la relationship between these two approaches? Well, I mean, if you think about any any agency, there's always a mixture of uh, mission oriented and and bottom up. I mean, it, you know, even the ERC, for example, has to this to define how much you give to mathematics and to sociology, right? Uh, that's that's kind of important. Uh, but at some point, you want also to have a lot of bottom-up. I'm like, I agree that we need much more bottom-up. Um, where you need a mission-oriented is when you have a clear demand and it has to be satisfied in the long term. So, for example, like defense, for example, is a good example of that, uh, where you, you want the continuity behind it. But, uh, but we clearly need more bottom-up. Um, let, let me just, if you, since I have the microphone, uh, let me just say a few words on what I heard earlier. And uh, you know, why, why is that that we make some recommendations which have been made a number of times already and they haven't happened? I mean, any report has to ask itself, you know, why is that that we are not doing what uh, other people have proposed in the past? And, you know, the answer usually is political economy. There are forces, either member states or the industry or whatever, which are influential and prevent that from, from happening. So if you think about the theme of contestability, which is obviously very, very important, very, very important to, to have contestability, um, that's, that's sometimes incumbent prevent that. And actually, Europe is not bad on that front. I mean, Thanks to Mario Monti, to Margaret Vestager, and so on, we have had a very strong antitrust policy. I mean, it could be stronger, uh, but you know, it's not worse than the U.S. for sure, and it's probably much better than the U.S. So, so that that's a good point. Um, on on the policy of uh, building connections, first, I don't think Europe can build connection. People who are expert in the arts actually build connections themselves. They have the knowledge for that. So the good collaboration always emerge bottom up. Uh, I realize that uh, there is a geo return, an implicit geo return uh, criterion for, 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 for Europe in many, many areas. I think it's just a bad policy. I mean, if you look at the US, uh, the policy, you know, the money from DARPA and SF and IH go to MIT and Stanford, it doesn't go to Kansas. It's not politically co correct to say that, but that's the truth. That's how, that's why that's one of the many reasons why NSF and IH DARPA and so on are, are so efficient. Um, and if you want to compensate or support other countries who do not quite get their share, you can do it differently and more efficiently. So that's one thing. I, I'm always worried about this political economy reasoning where you you look at each field in isolation and then you. You must say the, the, the money should be spread out. I think it's a, it's a dangerous policy. And on, on the capital market point of view, I just want to say one thing, which is 
we should study that uh, better, which is that there's no shortage of capital in Europe. Actually, we export capital. Uh, the question is, um, you know, Maybe we, we are facing adverse selection. Maybe we are taking projects. I have no clue, actually. We are taking projects that the American venture capitalists don't want to take. Uh, but in any case, it doesn't seem like there is no money in Europe, at least not in France. Um, and you know, finally, I agree with, with Marcus Schulter that uh, uh, this won't suffice. I mean, a report on, uh, on the EIC and always in Europe certainly won't suffice. There are many, many other reasons for why we like BI in innovation. It's just not a, a governance or, or orientation of, uh, of financing. If, if you think about the labor market regulation, for example, it's completely inappropriate in Europe for startups. If you think about universities that do not do their job in Europe, that's an important factor too. The fact that uh, entrepreneurship is not taught in universities in Europe and so on and so forth. I mean, you could go on and on, and, and clearly um, what we write, if it's correct, um, will never suffice actually to have, uh, to have innovation uh, in Europe being at the level of the US. Uh, but you know, it's a start. Thank you. So there's a contribution here, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Stephanie Strindl from BDI, Federation of German Industries. Um, and I just want to mention, so the last uh, months we're discussing, we have really profound discussions with other, in our memberships about how the future uh, framework program should be to, to get the innovation right. I like also just the disruptive idea, of course, is very important. But, uh, and I really feel that members are really, really committed, industries is really committed to make it right because we see we are lacking behind. But definitely one thing is, is that we, uh, we are far away from the 3% of the GDP, what we invest in, in, uh, in, in research and innovation. So this is really something we, we cannot invest less, definitely. But it also has to be really much more integrated between EU research policy, regional and on national level, to really make it, make it fit. We also need some kind of an industrial competitiveness uh, strategy that where innovation policy is fitted in, those must really be seen as a holistic thing. And, and one thing where we are lacking behind as well is, of course, when we have a good idea to get the um, added value, to, to get it into the market. But there's really the big gap. The money is made as elsewhere if we have a good idea or if we invent something great, that the innovation is the thing between, yeah, the transition between uh, the idea uh, into, into innovation is lagging that there we must find solutions to, to get it better. Thank you. Maybe you have an idea. <laughs> Thank you. So, reactions from the panel. How do we get the ideas to be bear fruit? Yeah, I think it's a very important point that you make here in terms of having sure that we have what, what we should do at the EU level versus the member states and, and regions have that much more coordinated because indeed most of the, f of the public funding will be uh, at, at, at the member states and regional level here. So we really have to make that case what we should do at the EU level uh, in subsidiarity with the national ones here. But that's why I actually also think that this instrument of the EIC and what I already mentioned, what there were also are similar uh, programs in the different member states, but the really going for the high gain, high risk, and particularly that risky type of projects here, for that you need a sufficient critical scale of applicants, of expertise in order to be evaluating, and of a sufficient budget also to be able to take that risk here, because a lot of them will fail, and only few of them will, will actually be in the longer term successes here, and that's is a kind of instrument that can actually be much better done at the EU level, uh, and in that respect is a subsidiarity argument why to do that at the, e at, at the EU level uh, here. But we should not be doing everything at the EU level, <laughs> fully agree here, and, and trying to coordinate what's already being done at the member states, but then also making sure that we use our state aid guidelines in order to make sure that what happens at the, at the different member states level is also sufficiently level playing field at the EU level and doesn't distort the competition here. So that means really state aid that, that should actually tackle a, a 
a, a market failure here and at the same time being proportional with the, the market problem that you are addressing here. So making so in that respect, even for what's going on at the member states, we still need sufficient EU coordination to avoid that, that we actually end up in, in, in negative zero sum uh, games uh, here. Daniel, you? Yeah, when you were talking about the input of uh, associations of industries, um, I was thinking maybe uh, the innovation policy should not be useful for existing industry. <laughs> it should be something that threatens established industries. I exaggerate a bit. It should be about the future, the new ones. I can understand that the incumbents prefer to have something that is useful for them in the incremental uh, way that was dis discussed earlier. Uh, but uh, here I would really say that uh, we, in this particular part uh, of, uh, of Horizon, and when we really want to look at disruptive innovation, uh, then uh, we should look at things that are maybe not so much of interest to existing industries, but hopefully foster the emergence of new ones. Competition spirit is alive. Please. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Pardon. My name is uh, Wolfgang Pape. I'm working on global governance issues now, formally in the Commission. I was very much impressed by the book uh, Brussels Effect on the normalization and all these issues regulation where even with the AI Act, Brussels is still up front. And I asked myself how fast this is some kind of a slowing down of innovation because we are setting frames and only within this frame of the law we can innovate. Isn't that a problem there? Because when we talk about disruptive innovation, what is disruptive? It means that the standard which is given is disrupted. This kind of contradiction here, is that a problem of Europe? Because we are looking ahead, ahead apparently in social terms, but in innovative terms we are lacking behind the others. And I would even add sometimes Koreans and Japanese are ahead of us. It's not only China and the US. Thank you. Yeah, that's of course. <laughs> okay. Th that's really also a very important challenge that we are facing here with new technologies here, and particularly also with AI. It will have very important implications of how we are going to use uh, AI here. And in that respect, it might need indeed regulatory setting in order to make sure that we get the right kind of innovations uh, here. But of course, that's a very tricky exercise here to make sure that we, that we get the regulation right such that it gets the right kind of, 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 of innovations from these new technologies here. And that's really very tricky because we, the way in which we sometimes design these regulations are also very often within a very incumbent way mind here, so that we might, with the way in which we regulate, exclude um, new, new players here that are using these technologies still. With so my argument is, or, or my reaction is, yes, we do need regulation, but a regulation that is sufficiently technology neutral, that it sets the objectives of what we want from society, but not too specific in terms of this technology not, this way not, that way not. So we have to be very careful how we design that regulation. And also, if we do this at Europe, that we also, I mean, this is a global game <laughs> playing here so that, that we can also coordinate that kind of regulation uh, at, at a global level here such that uh, it becomes also something that will will de help develop uh, innovations for the global market and not just only in, in, in Europe. Markus Schulte on this. Well, I find myself agreeing with pretty much everything that Ranild is saying. Uh, in in terms of let's say from the innovation policy angle, I I just uh, can't can't disagree with that. Uh, then it is of course clear that with uh, our IA Act and the regulation we're setting, and maybe similar a few years before the General Data Protection Regulation, these are all examples of a clear of expressing a clear European preference for a clear frame uh, that inspires trust and that might well hopefully become a global standard that is uh, that is sort of the ideal positive thinking behind it 
and and therefore may, may be an asset. And of course, we all know the debate around, let's say, the, when we talk about the venture capital or why Europe is behind there, there is always the element of culture in there. Uh, so I, I would uh, very much like to agree with what Professor Tirol said on, on entrepreneurship education as one example. Um, and it probably spans much further, in, also in the portfolio of my commissioner. She, of course, the commissioner has no competence in the area of education, apart from supporting and coordinating. Um, but in view of what we're discussing here today, uh, there are elements where there is clear need for action at EU level, and that concerns, for example, talent mobility, making Europe attractive for talent, not only inside, also from the outside, uh, to make sure we retain our talent, um, and then at, at the same at, in, at the, in the same vein, uh, what we you know the, what we coordinate, discuss, support uh, with member states on education, on entrepreneurship, but also um, on on these broader issues. And maybe over time, this can have an impact. Obviously, this this is uh, too too far removed from what we're discussing here, but it's it's an important element. And this culture element in terms of risk uh, aversion, for example, is something that come ups, comes up invariably and is a, is a, is a factor. And I'm not sure whether we can influence that, and certainly not, not fast, but I would say it's important to talk about it and to see what aspects of education can be helpful. But you do have a very important instrument in your portfolio for talent mobility, which is the Marie Curie Fellowship uh, here. Not only geographic mobility, but also from science to industry. And so unfortunately... Okay, can, I, can I maybe raise a question, Marcus? I believe many people have on their minds. So you mentioned the AI regulation. So if it's true that Europe lags behind in AI, is this in contradiction with the idea that we are the first to regulate it? <laughs> it, se it, it seems a bit strange that, okay, we, uh, we are saying like we know, know very little, we're not very good at this technology, but we want to be the leaders in regulating it. Is, is this a contradiction or uh, would you say it, it makes sense in some hard to understand way? Well, the way, the way I put it before is that uh, there is uh, there is, of course, I mentioned the General Data Protection Regulation, AI, uh, that there is uh, the, uh, the intention to make sure there is, a, there is an environment where that can be trusted, which can lead to buy-in and to acceptability socially, which is something that uh, in Europe we can't uh, do without. So there is a, a broad European consensus uh, behind that. Which, uh, which comes through the legislative process through which uh, this goes with uh, the co-legislators. Um, the, the, uh, the, there is a balance to be struck. Now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert on either of these two, uh, but I would say the rationale is this, a framework that inspires trust, and when we look at just a, uh, AI and science, for example, uh, there we are looking at, at guidelines that come sort of are not, not imposed by anybody or proposed by the Commission, but where the science community sees a need to, for such guidelines uh, to, to make sure that the use of AI um, is, is done in a way that can be trusted and produces positive results. Now, uh, I, I don't, you could also say I don't have a straight answer to your question, but, mm -hmm. but there we are. Well, yeah, the idea seems to be that you know, this is regulation that is supposed to support innovation rather than Preventing it, or let's say the right type of no, rather than the opposite. Yeah, that. Please. Thank you very much. It's Wenyu Hu from uh, Assam Info Board. If I may, I would like to offer a bright picture on EU's innovation from the point of view of a patent, the state of the art innovation. I find uh, Europe actually is doing very, very well. And uh, if we look at uh, the WIPO in, uh, Global Innovation Index 2023, among the top 10 most uh, innovative economies, six of them are from Europe. And uh, uh, there was a slide uh, uh, just now uh, listing uh, different uh, uh, cities in Europe 
Actually, some of them are the world's top uh, innovation clusters, like Munich, where BM, uh, BMW is. There's also Nuremberg, where Siemens is. There's also Amsterdam, Eidenhoven. There's also Paris. So I think uh, uh, in terms of innovation, uh, Europe is still uh, top. Of course, there are other countries, for example, in the East Asia, uh, lots of countries are coming up. But even in terms of uh, stimulating uh, innovation, let's not forget there's also this uh, unitary patent rights, that uh, the unitary patent that uh, the, uh, is now in effect uh, uh, in Europe. I find it's uh, uh, because my PhD is on patent. I, I wrote on patent on licensing during the uh, COVID licensing debate uh, as well. Uh, but in terms of unitary patent, I find it's a fantastic idea uh, to stimulate innovation where um, application fees are cheaper to pay one application fee instead of to pay 27 application fees uh, translating 27 times uh, in the EU and also easier for enforcement because now there's also a unitary patent court in Munich so enforce uh, a, pat uh, a unitary patent right in the EU all over. So I find it's uh, a fantastic idea to uh, stimulating um, innovation where maybe ordinary people can afford to innovate as well. If we uh, look at uh, Japan's uh, example, how in the 80s, 60s, that uh, uh, there was an innovation boom uh, in Japan where everybody could uh, afford to uh, innovate. Also, uh, just now, Wolfgang uh, mentioned about uh, the uh, Brussels effect. I find that it, even in terms of uh, patent regulation, the effect is great. Uh, I just give one example. The uh, five-year pharma licensing uh, period, instead of 20 years, in Europe, the pharma uh, patent lasts 25 years, and China has adopted this uh, five-year licensing uh, term in its latest uh, patent law. And uh, that's, I find it's even against uh, usually their uh, developing country mentality. Patent right, uh, pharma patent uh, protection period is longer, whereas usually developing countries want to have a shorter uh, pay, pharma patent uh, period so they could uh, uh, produce uh, um, generic uh, uh, pharmaceutical products. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Hilde, I think that one's for you. So a patent perspective on, on in innovation, does that lead to a different picture? Yep. So if we look at what are important incentives for firms to innovate, and then also particularly young new startups, the drastic innovators that, that will bring the high gain, high risk type of disruptive innovations. IP, of course, IP protection is a very important part of, of, of that incentive here, but it's not the only one here. So you also need to have high commercial returns uh, from that, also access to, to capital. So IP is an important part, but it's part of the policy mix here. Now, usually if we, if we compare uh, our European startups um, with, with US, and it's not necessarily that they differ in terms of how good they can actually can actually protect their IP uh, here. It, it used to be really much, much more expensive in Europe because we had this fragmented system here. The unitary patent really brings one step forward in terms of reducing those costs here. So I don't think that that's the critical thing that really de-blocks this um, this um, dynamics that we actually want here. It's more really getting Ret higher returns from larger markets here and, and capital market imperfections. Uh, and IP is no longer a critical, uh, a really critical issue that differentiates us from, from others uh, here. So in that respect, I think we should focus in terms of policy more on, on other dimensions than the IP protection here, but still um, monitoring whether the unitary patent really is delivering what we, what we hope here in terms of sufficiently reducing the cost of IP protection for particularly these young new startups. Thank you. Um, Daniel, would you like to add? Or? Yeah, very, very briefly. 
Uh, coming back to, uh, I think, a constant theme in our report, it's not so much uh, the quantity, but the quality and the composition. Uh, you are right that the unitary pattern is a big step forward, uh, but the question is, it will also will it be mainly used by the incumbents, by the existing industries. Uh, will it have an impact on the new ones? Will it help those? And I think most uh, startups don't think about whether they have 20 or 25 years of patent protection. They just struggle to get their technology um, in place. And uh, therefore, I would say, yes, it's a very good step forward in, in general terms. But if I may repeat the mid-technology trap, <laughs> right? If you want to get out of the uh, beaten path, um, I think that's not really something that helps. Economists have a difficult life because they constantly have to defend invisible things, <laughs> the things that might happen but uh, haven't uh, happened. Now we are approaching uh, the end of our time, uh, so I think we have room maybe for one last comment or question, maybe also from the panel, things that should still be mentioned. Please, there's one here. Clemens Schuster, running an AI startup on policy monitoring in Europe. Um, if uh, the Commission and uh, all the stakeholders want to have kind of a hint uh, what to do as a homework uh, for the next steps, I think there is kind of plenty of, of uh, funding, there is kind of plenty of research, so it's pretty much there, there is quite a lot of things around. What, you're, what we are really lagging behind is when it comes to the down-to-earth, day-to-day nitty-gritty details. Uh, in my case, uh, my team out of 27 people consists of 19 nationalities in Europe. Some of them are even based remotely. Um, I cannot employ them because there is no, nothing like something uh, a European employment, nothing like a pension system, nothing like a social security system, ending up having all of them as uh, freelancers without any uh, securities, all of that stuff around. If you want to really do for the hard work, that's pretty much where you have to go to. Yes, I know it's council, it's nasty, it's national politics, all of that stuff, but um, if you really want to do some favor for those who innovate in Europe, uh, please let them uh, or get rid of these really, really nasty stuff. Yep. Thank you very much. I think that does take us back to the very beginning of European integration, really, which is yes. the internal market, which is labor mobility. Uh, and uh, what you're saying confirms, I think, something many of us experience. We don't have this internal market, yet we think we live in an internal market without borders, but once we try to cross them, uh, you know, often we're aware we, you know, there is no internal market or the internal market is simply incomplete. Uh, so the good news is uh, we have assets, we have potentials we can work to use in the future, uh, and um, I guess that's part of the job of the new commission which is incoming. So we are coming to the end of our time. Let me uh, thank our host again, uh, the Bavarian representation, for providing this venue. Let me thank the CES EFO team for the technical work uh, that, um, uh, this, you know, despite some hiccups, Jean uh, worked very well in the end. <laughs> uh, many thanks to all who have been participating online. Uh, thanks to Mario and Jean in particular, but to everybody else who's been participating online. Many thanks to the panel and many thanks uh, in particular to all of you for coming here, for being here. Also for, uh, thanks to those who uh, attended the earlier uh, export, uh, the earlier expert work workshop. Uh, I think this has been a very fruitful debate, obviously not the end of the debate about European innovation, but uh, I think a fruitful step. So. Thanks to all of you uh, and take care. Thank you.